Hi everybody and welcome back to Nick Talks. This episode's amazing guest really is amazing, an Olympian, Shavin Davis, an excellent swimmer. Thank you, Shavin, for, for coming on the show. That's all right, Nick. Nice to see you. Um, I remember you. I remember most of your career. I remember you at the Moscow Olympics. Um, those days for younger viewers, there was like three TV channels. So everybody watched the same thing those days. But you, um, Fatima Whitbread, um, Daley Thompson, I, I remember you guys winning medals and representing Great Britain. And that was a fantastic time. Yeah, like Tess and Seb, you know, Steve Overt and obviously Roger Black. And it went into that era as well. So there was a kind of, um, I suppose, a golden era of of larger than life personalities. And I always feel quite sorry for the athletes of today because they're not almost allowed to have those larger than life personalities because of social media, you know, because of all their sort of commercial contracts, everyone sometimes is a little bit vanilla. And and we had a lot of good characters in the old days. Yeah, we did. A question I wasn't going to ask you, how did you and your colleagues fund yourselves at the time? Because it it really, there really wasn't the, the funding and the advertisements and the sponsorship like there is now. Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, we literally funded ourselves. That was it. You know, it was the bank of mum and dad most of the time. Um, we had university options in the States. So when I finished competing in Moscow, I kind of had two options. One was to go on the dole um, and the other was to go to university in America. So I decided to go to Berkeley, um, which is just outside of San Francisco. And to maintain my scholarship, I had to swim because that was obviously you know, the reason for the scholarship. And I just really needed six months off. And in those days, you couldn't have it. So I came back to the UK and started working in some television, um, did a TV show called Give Us a Clue, got branded a professional for 40 quid and then was not allowed to compete anymore. And that was at the same time as Steve Overt and Seb Co were racing each other every single weekend and they had trust funds in track and field and I wasn't allowed to have one. So it was a very strange time when all the rules were kind of changing. You know, we were training like professionals. We were training six hours a day and it was a full time job, just the same as they are today. But we were treated as if we were supposed to be amateur and we weren't allowed to receive anything. And like I said, I was done for 40 pounds for not even swimming for 40 pounds, but appearing on a TV show, you know. So, yeah, strange times. Absolutely. And that's a good segue into my main question about the rules. You were competing at a time when there was mass cheating involved in sports, especially the Soviet Union teams, especially East Germany. How did that affect you? Yeah, predominantly the Eastern Bloc. So it was East Germany. Um, I mean, I think in swimming, I can probably say my hand on my heart. I didn't really think that the Russians at that time, we've had since we've had problems, certainly since Sochi. But in those days, it was very much the East German Bloc. And they were giving very nasty testosterone and steroids to their young female athletes in swimming, track and field and in rowing in particular. And they totally dominated from the 1976, 1980, and the 1988 Olympics. They missed 84 because they were doing a tit for tat, you know, boycott. So, so it was a 20 year period where they were giving them these terrible drugs. Some of them as young as 11 and 12, which had awful side effects, but of course gave them the, you know, the biological strength of being uh, basically going through a male puberty. And so they were winning by miles. Um, in fact, the, the woman that beat me um, still holds the German record now, 42 years later. <laughs> so, I mean, it's, yeah, a bit ridiculous, really. You know, it, it really is. And, and what's also frustrating for me is that my last 100 metres in the 400 IM was faster than hers. So the more explosive the event, the bigger advantage they have, which is what we see today, obviously. You know, if you look at a difference in performance between a male and female, something like boxing, a male will hit 160% harder. Something like, say, middle distance or long distance running is about 10%. So the more explosive an event is, the bigger the advantage to, to male biology, really. And why couldn't we detect what they were doing at the time because now we have drug tests surely drug tests were available in the 80s oh yeah 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 well we had drug testing um but it was only testing at competition so we had no out of season testing so i don't know if you can see over my shoulder but but I, last year i did a book called unfair play which is all about the battle for women's sport 
And so we were able to show, you know, what they were actually doing and how they were actually doing. Because the moment the wall came down, we had access to an awful lot of paperwork. And, and, and then there was a lot of court cases in the um, in the German courts. So we've got all of the evidence, you know, um, ups and down to the dosages that they were taking. But what they were making sure was that they were cleaning their athletes out about a week or so before they left. And they would make sure that they were clean, put them on bikes, sweat out the drugs. Um, check, you know, that they would pass a drug test and then send them off to the Olympics or the Europeans or wherever. And so sometimes we would even get to a major international. We would have um, athletes we'd never seen before. We'd never seen them on the international stage ever. And they would just come in and break a world record. So we all knew, you know, we all knew exactly what was going on, but nobody did anything about it. And women's sport was just absolutely decimated for, for 20 years. And I had friends that were fourth, you know, and fifth and never got on the Olympic podium and whose whole lives would have been different if, you know, proper fair sport had been in place, which is why I'm so vocal about fair sport today, because I just don't want another generation of young women to, to lose out. For people who don't understand the benefits of taking these drugs, but not taking them while you're competing, correct me if I'm wrong, my understanding is you win races the year before with all the hard training you do. And if you're taking drugs to enhance your training and pushing yourself further and building muscle, and then you come off the drugs two weeks before the event, all the benefits of those drugs, you've already gotten those benefits. So you can be clean for the event, but taking those drugs has made you better than you would have been without them. Is that correct? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you know, steroids, are the, the most abused steroid in, in the world of sport really is testosterone. Same with weightlifting and, and bodybuilding. Um, you know, it has some very nasty side effects, particularly if you're a female, because it's not meant to be in our body in those great, you know, quantities. The women's levels are, are below one nanomol of testosterone per liter of blood. The average male is somewhere in the 15, 16, so anywhere between seven and a half and 32. So it's, you know, vastly difference between male and female, the amount of testosterone in our systems. And that kicks in, as we know, you know, in puberty um, with young lads. I mean, I've got a 17 year old son, you know, who's been grunting like a a typical you know boy since he was about 14 years old and it's it is it is the big difference between us there's also things like the q angle of our hips which are very different between women and men and that enables men to have more power that they can put through because they don't have such a wide angle and football's really interesting you know we know that female footballers get something like six times as many knee injuries as males because of this q angle so uh, and you know slightly more lax ligaments and things because it's all very very hormonal so yes i mean it's not really the year before um it will be many years so you know as i mentioned they were putting these young girls on testosterone some of them as young as 11 so they were basically putting them through a male puberty um, and then they would be doing all of the training building all the muscle enabling all of the recovery which again comes from you know having the benefit of these drugs and then coming off them making sure that they would clean as far as the test was concerned and off they would perform and you know in the 1980 olympics when i won my medal um we had i think it was 80 percent of one two three sweeps by east germans in the women's events and i can only think of two people that won medals that weren't from the eastern bloc during that olympic Games in women's sport and that was myself and, and michelle smith from australia and I was the only British female athlete in the whole of our Olympic team to win an individual medal. And we had the likes of people like Kathy Smallwood, you know, he was a phenomenal track athlete. Um, but again, missed out through the whole of that period because she constantly came up against the Eastern Bloc athletes. And that was cheating. Plain and simple cheating. Yeah. Yes. And, and very frustrating cheating, you know, when you knew that. So you'd be going home training six hours a day, getting up at five o'clock in the morning every day, not having any lottery funding, having to you know use all holiday money and, and mum's new washing machine money and all that sort of stuff for me to do my sport, knowing that nobody at the IOC or international swimming or international track and field was doing anything to try and stop this year after year after year. And it was very demoralizing, you know, to, to know that. Um, and I suppose what, what got us through it was that we just wanted to do the sport. We loved it. Um, it was our window of opportunity regardless. And I was I never felt any animosity towards the girls in particular. I was actually quite sorry for them because, you know, they were totally and utterly pawns in the whole of this. And they were used as lab rats, you know, with awful fallout. You know, many of them have died since. So it's um, two groups of women were very badly let down by the IOC during that period of time.
Oh, absolutely. You can't blame that 11-year-old East German potential athlete for what her parents and coaches and government... Oh, not her parents. Not her parents. So they were removed from their parents. So in fact, the parents would um, often try to remove their children. So once it was becoming obvious to the German people what was going on, the parents would try to actually, you know, keep, but you've got to remember this was the days of the Stasi and, uh, you know, it was a very different world than the world it is today. So those kids, if they were deemed as having potential, were just removed and put into the training camps. And that was it. We've always had cheats in sports from the from the day the first person invented the very first sport, whatever it was, there was someone going, I'm going to cheat here so I can win. We've always had cheats. We've got cheats at the moment in in across the Western world who I think are cheating and they happen to be males who say they're females so they can compete in women's sports. And just like these Germans, they seem to be breaking all the records and winning all the medals and are denying biological women their right to compete. Would that be a fair summary? Yeah, so the rule changed in 2015, which was again as an IOC decision, not based on any science, uh, not based on talking to any female athletes whatsoever, only listening to trans advocates um, and taking the premise that there's no difference between male and females. Well, which is a ridiculous premise, right? Because we know that we have men and women's races for very obvious reasons, you know, and if we didn't, only men would win anything. And and so to make that as the, you know, the premise to start from was ridiculous. Then we've had all of these numerous amounts of testosterone that people are supposed to have in their system for one year, five years, five nanomol, 10 nanomol. Again, none of it makes any sense because once you've gone through male puberty and developed that strength, you're not going to be able to remove it. We've got studies showing after 14 years of suppressing testosterone that it makes practically no difference to male strength. Um, and there's 18 studies in the world, all peer reviewed, and all of them show we can't you know, remove male puberty advantage. And yet there's not one single one study that will show that you can. And yet we're still here basically saying to women, you're not worthy of fair sport. And I just thought that's not right. You know, I don't want anyone to be barred from sport. I love sport. I want everyone to do sport. But I want fair sport for females. Now, when you think that there's a thousand women in the UK that earn their living from sport, there's 11,000 men. And I can guarantee you that there's 11,000 men earn a lot more than those 1,000 women, for starters. And then out of the sponsorship dollar, so that's the money that comes into sport, women get 2% of it. So we only have this very tiny slice of the cake anyway. And now we're being told we've got to budge over for people who feel like a sex that they're not. And so I just, I can't sit by and watch this happen again to another generation of, you know, young female athletes. I've got to say something. But, um, and, and we are very slowly clawing it back. So World Aquatics now protects the female category, World Rugby, World Boxing, World Track and Field, uh, British Triathlon, British Rowing, World Cycling. But there are still 60 sports here in the UK, including six combat sports. That's fighting sports that allow men to self-ID without doing anything into fighting or racing females, which is insane, basically. It's it's abuse. It's abuse. I've seen some of the fights in MMA with um, men who, who pretend to be women fighting women, and it looks like a crime is happening. Absolutely appalling. Now, I don't think these men think they're women. I, I really honestly believe this is just the latest form of cheating, and I think these men may convince themselves they feel like women, but, but deep down inside, they know they're not. Because every single one of them I've ever heard of was already competing as a man in male sports and didn't get anywhere and then, and then transitioned. If we had somebody who's always thought there was a girl from seven years old and then moved up the ranks and then started competing against girls. It still would be wrong, but I would understand that. But every single one of these male athletes were mediocre against their peers and then decided, I'm going to play with the women because I can beat them. Yeah, and in some instances, you know, cause some serious injuries. That's the thing as well. So something like football, there's 50 trans-identifying males at the moment in the English Football League, and the vast majority of those are, are goalkeepers because the ability to be taller, to be more explosive, to have bigger hands makes you a much better goalkeeper. And so, you know, and, and therefore the injury risk for those females playing against them is doubled or trebled. You know, and so you're meaning you're saying that these young girls have got to take on males knowing that they could get an injury which would end their career. 
And that's that's just, it's negligence, you know, on behalf of the FA, to be honest with you. And it's cowardice. They were all being frightened of potential, I don't know, threatening behavior, you know, from Stonewall in particular, who are misrepresenting the Equality Act. And the Equality Act says that you can protect the female category in sport, the biological female category in sport for fairness and, you know, and dignity and safety. So if that wasn't the case, we wouldn't have swimming and cycling and track and field being able to do it. They would have been taken to court and lost, but they have. And so these other sports are just are just being cowards. And they're they're putting a very small number of males' feelings in front of the safety and fairness of every single female that does their sport. And, and I find it so depressing after all this time <laughs> that we seem to be back here in a very misogynic, you know, misogynistic world where women's sport just doesn't matter. You said a really good word then that I completely agree with, cowardice. That's why this is happening, because the heads of these bodies who should be looking after female sports are cowards. They don't want to be called hurty words, and the hurty word is homophobic, transphobic. So they would rather protect their own career and their own reputation and destroy the lives, the sporting abilities of women. And we see that throughout society. That's why everything seems to be crumbling at the moment, because the people who should be looking after us or running the country or running the NHS or running all these institutions are just too cowardly to do the job anymore because their career and their personal feelings trump what they should be doing. We, we are living in very strange times, aren't we? You know, it feels very Orwellian, you know, at the moment. Um, you know, it's, I mean, I am all for anybody expressing themselves however they would like to. You know, I was, you know, lived through the 80s when we had guys wearing, you know, Boy George, people wearing makeup, day fabric. nobody cared less. You know, nobody cared less what people wanted to wear, how they wanted to express themselves. Um, you know, whether that was in a feminine or a masculine way or whatever. However, biological sex is set. We can't change it. As human beings, it is impossible to change your biological sex. And we're not doing our children any favours by lying to them, you know, it, because they will always know and they will always be battling it. And many, many, many of them will regret what they've done in years to come. And I do believe that there's a lot of autistic children, children that are, you know, are traumatized, gay children at the moment that are going to be taking very big court cases in, in years to come. Um, and that's because there are a lot of people that are not standing up for them, that are just going with the tie because it's the easy option. And I, you know, I just wouldn't be able to live with myself if I didn't say something. And it has impacted my career. There's no doubt about it. But for me, I felt it was worth it. You know, I was in the, a position where I have paid off most of my house. I'm a little bit more mature and and I could afford to take the hit, you know, and, and that's what I've done because I have to be able to live with myself in five years, 10 years time. Exactly. You don't want people saying to you, and just like they did with Jimmy Savile, saying to people, you knew, you heard the rumours, but you did nothing because you were too cowardly and you've got to live with that. And honestly, obviously, you've taken the right stance there because because your personal morality is more important to you than the, the next couple of quid. I do want everyone to do sport, you know, however anyone identifies, however they feel comfortable, whatever they feel comfortable calling themselves or wearing. I still want them to be able to do sport. However, I want 51 percent of the world to have fair sport, the same as the 49 percent of the males on this planet. So, and I don't think that's an unreasonable thing to, to ask for. So if it means we've got to create extra categories or we've got to create an open category or whatever it is we need to do, we need to be having, you know, respectful, honest debate and finding ways to be inclusive for everybody, um, but also finding ways to make sure that we protect the opportunities of, of females. Absolutely. Let's end with some good news and, and some positivity. I think the trans thing is ending. I think it snuck in because we weren't watching for it. But I think the more people understand it and the more people like you speak out and other people speak out, I think the general population now is beginning to look at this and going, none of this is right. None of this is reality. And I think it's beginning to get pushed away. What's your feelings and, and, and what are you hearing and seeing? Yeah, well, for a long time, Stonewall in particular would use all of those words you mentioned to mm. close down debate. So yes. we weren't allowed to, to present the facts. You know, we weren't allowed to say, here are the statistics of the children that are being put through this. And a very large proportion of them are autistic. 
um, we weren't allowed to even talk about it. You know, mm. and now we are. We're, the, 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 it, it's like a dam and it's beginning to burst and all those figures are beginning to come out. But an awful lot of people will have been damaged. Mm. Um, you know, and I'd like to think that I've done my tiny little bit to stop a few female athletes missing out, you know, and hopefully... You know, very soon all of the all of the sports will, will do the right thing. But it's the IOC's job to do the right thing. It's the IOC's fault. If they hadn't done what they did in 2015, this would not have happened. Um, and they're still passing the buck, you know, to every other sport rather than doing anything about it, which is what they've done with everything, you know, throughout the whole of this history of the IOC. They're a very disappointing organization. We need a massive clean house like we did with, you know, with FIFA, um, with, with the IOC. <laughs> But, you know, I mean, and if you want to read some of the horrendous stuff that go on, you should grab the book because it's mm. it's absolutely mind boggling the things that they've been able to get away with. But, yeah, I think you're right. I think people are beginning to to understand more that, you know, it's not as simple um, as people, you know, as, as certain sections of society would like mm. to admit. And we might have a youngster that genuinely has um, gender dysphoria which is extremely different than a 60 year old man who has autogynephilia, which means yes. that he likes to run around in his wife's heels and his he in, in, in her stockings yeah. because that excites him. Mm. And so there's like two very big differences in those areas. And unfortunately one area is sacrificing the other area because that means that they can wear their stockings and their red heels and go into changing rooms on the high street. And that's quite scary for women. And that's why mm. women are trying to push back, you know, because mm. 99% of sexual assaults are, are, are men on women. And, you know, women feel very threatened in those private spaces, whether that's toilets or changing rooms or, you know, locker rooms or wherever. And, and again, what's very interesting, if you look at sexual assault in changing rooms, for example, over 85% of those sexual assaults are in mixed changing rooms. <clears throat> but the moment you put an environment, you know, where men feel perfectly happy to... I don't know, intimidate a woman, then they will. Whereas if you have a separate changing room, they're much less likely to go in there. But if you turn around and say to them, well, you can self-identify as a woman, you haven't got to do anything. Because hmm. that's, that's the other misconception is the vast majority of people who identify as female do absolutely nothing to, you know, they don't have surgery, they don't suppress testosterone, they don't do anything. They don't even shave. Some of them don't even shave. Yeah. You know, so so that's very intimidating for a, a female who knows that she can't, in a, you know, it, if she's cornered, she physically isn't going to be able to fight off uh, most men. Um, and, you know, with children, it's even worse, isn't it? You know, because these youngsters are, they're not old enough to make these decisions. They're not old enough to say, I'm quite happy to be sterilized. I'm quite happy to be medicalized for the rest of my life. I'm never going to change my mind. I'm quite happy never to have an orgasm ever. And that's what we're doing to them. You know, and then at 15, 16, they're not old enough to make that decision. They're not old enough to decide they want to smoke, drink, get married, you know, have a tattoo. They're certainly not old enough to decide something like that. So it's really important that we bring some common sense to this situation and, and we just look at all the facts. And then we try to help anybody and everybody that needs it. Is your book available on Amazon? Yes, it is. It's available in most decent bookshops and it's available on Amazon. It's back there. It was a short list. William Hill Sports Book of the Year, and it's been shortlisted for the Times and the Telegraph, which is quite cool. And um, I'm speaking at the Oxford Literary Festival in a couple of weeks' time. So, yeah, well, and, and, and the paper comes out in June, just before the Olympics. So, I will be full side for the BBC again in Paris, which will be my 13th Olympic Games. And um, yeah, so it's all it's all very exciting. So, yeah. Well, if anybody wants Shavin's book, if you go in the description of this video, there'll be a link there, take you straight to Amazon so you can buy the book. Shavin, thank you very much for, for, for coming on. It's lovely talking to you. And you brought back so many memories of the early 80s. Um, and I wish I could speak to all your other colleagues as well. So you never know. They're a good bunch. We do all stay in touch with each other, which is quite oh, cool. I was a bridesmaid at, um, at Tessa's wedding and she sent me a picture just yesterday. Right. That, you know, so we do. French sports makes, makes good friendships and you. They last a lifetime. Fantastic. Enjoy the rest of your evening. And thank you so much for being a guest. Take care, Nick. Bye-bye. Thank you. If you like that video, don't forget to subscribe to the channel, hit that notification bell and comment. And if you like what I'm saying about running for Mayor of Greater Manchester, then stick around. Tell your family, tell your friends. It's the only way I'm going to have a chance of winning is a grassroots movement. So be part of that movement and hit that bell. Thanks.